Kia ora koutou. Um, on behalf of NDF, we're really excited to welcome Emerson Vandy and Gus Motazuki, who are going to be... So we had a little bit of technical difficulty, but we'll jump right into it now. And um, here's uh, Emerson and Gus. And I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you so much, folks. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Emerson ahau, Kei te kai whakahari ngā pūnaha, uh, whiako matahiko, i roto e te pūna matauranga o Aotearoa. Nō no Ofereo Bay, āhau. Uh, Rauan nō no Whare Pahi, āhau. Uh, ko Dutch, ko Danish, ko Irish, ko French, etc. Ngā hapu. Uh, ko Tangata Tiriti, āhau. Kia ora. Uh, so normally with these kinds of presentations, you know, I mask the imposter syndrome by buggering off to the barbers and getting a haircut or something so that I can, like, chase away the werewolf of imposter syndrome with some kind of veneer of, hey, this is the real Emerson here. Um, I don't have that today. I've got, like, a toddler at home who's two. I've got a newborn who's nine weeks old. And, I mean, you guys are lucky I turned up in shoes. <laughs> I am in absolute disarray. So um, thank you for deciding to turn up today and bringing your presence here, and we hope we can bring you some interesting corridor. So, um, first provocation. What is harvesting? Why is it cool when we do it, but creepy when OpenAI do it? I, this is a much safer title for us to use. Let's talk about Supplejack. Uh, we'll come back to the AI stuff a little bit later. What I want to show you is a bit of a blast from the past. This is the Digital NZ website circa 2009. It's an exotic fusion of data APIs and brown, yellow, and ochre web design. That was the world at the time. Um, we were very proud of it. We thought it enabled some very cool things. Um, so despite the striking color palette, what was most significant with the young Digital NZ was the fact that the young service embodied some relationships between the service and partners in the service. We established relationships with stakeholders from other institutions, other organisations, to support harvesting activities. So it meant that those activities were implicitly consensual and mutually fulfilling. Um, by having a formalised relationship with the content partner, we could mutually agree to the harvesting activity using our tools and their content. You know, right? Nice partnership stuff. So this is the service now. Many, many iterations later, but arguably the most significant ingredients are still those same two dimensions. It's still about the relationships and the harvesting. That hasn't changed. Our original harvesting tool was used from 2008 to 2013, and I would tell my former colleague, Elliot Young, who worked here also many years ago. Elliot came up with the Java Harvester because we needed one. And I don't know much other about it other than the fact that at a certain point we knew we needed to shift away from it because we weren't living in 2008 anymore. We created a new tool called Supplejack, which is an extract, transform, and load application. This was originally developed in 2013, and it's being used up until now. Um, I would acknowledge my colleague, former colleague, Chris McDowell, in the development of this tool. So think about those numbers for a second. It's 2023 and Supplejack is 10 years old. And we've done some iterations on it. It's done some things, it's changed a little bit. But it does raise some questions, that one particularly. And the answer is a kind of classic, yeah, nah, yeah, sort of. That's your answer. Um, the big collections were really difficult to achieve with the original version of Supplejack, and small collections, no problems. You know, our harvesting work could proceed with small collections, no problem. Easy as, great. The final year, at the twist at the end of it, is the fact that it meant that we were kind of biasing the collections we were presenting toward those small collections. We were kind of bypassing the big ones. They were in the hard basket. And that's, is that the right thing to do? You know, that's a legit question to ask. So there is now big data in the New Zealand culture and heritage sector, and there's increasingly more and more and more of it. So, paper, I mean, this is one example. Papers passed. This site alone comprises 105 million canonical web pages, and that's ignoring derivative web pages where you might have other 
strings in other context or search results or anything else. Um, it's a crap ton of pages. So thinking about that, how's our harvesting tools going to deal with that? And the answer was um, really not very gracefully. What was the problem? Were there other opportunities? Our version of Supplejack could not deliver large harvests consistently. It's, the tool was serializing some of its tasks. So if you think about a really honking big collection, let's say 105 million records, what it was doing was finding the first record. It would extract it, it would transform it, it would load it, it would repeat that 105 million times, but it wouldn't tell you if it had messed one of them up and the whole harvest wouldn't work, it would just get to a certain point and fail. So that sucked. Um, and the visibility into that process for our harvesters was poor. Um, I mean, folks like Dan and Tim, my other colleagues, had to do some really sort of forensic analysis around those harvests to understand why they were breaking, why they weren't working. So we sat down and we talked this through with the Boost crew and we framed the problem as the new tool needs to respect the time of harvesting staff. We felt that was a good way to encapsulate a lot of the problems that we were encountering with our work. All right, yeah, so the problem was actually really straightforward. One opportunity we saw was that I was actually sparked by one of the insights that one of the boost devs came up with at Stand Up one day. He made this a really, what he thought was a throwaway comment that I just latched on like white on rice. I thought it was awesome. He said, I tend to just look at what software's out there, see what I can install and get up and running quickly, and see if the documentation covers my questions. And this just seemed to me like the most ridiculously obvious way, or obvious set of qualities that good software should have. And that seemed to me like those are the qualities we wanted Supplejack to have. Having a simplified, semi-automatic installation process will open up new use cases and new users for the tool. It will make it more available, easier for them to engage with and experiment with. Um, so first opportunity, it's that. We haven't come back to this yet, but this is one of the three big opportunities we see with the work we've done. Um, there was an opportunity to make the harvesting more mature, more modular, the stack itself. So like, as a memory institution, we don't want our work to be tied to any one piece of software or any one technology. And it's kind of for that theoretical doomsday scenario. What if there's some kind of fundamental vulnerability with this or some vendor goes underwater, what happens? Do we want to be tied to that? And to an extent you can be, but it's nice to have wiggle room and to be able to pivot to using some other technology easily. So we started thinking about, okay, what if, you know, we like using MongoDB, but what if there's someone who might totally benefit from Supplejack, but they don't want to use MongoDB because they're neck deep in using GraphDB or something else? That's legit. So one of the opportunities is we take this big chunk and massive software that we've made that are all tightly coupled bits, and we just make them nice and modular so people can take out some parts and put other parts in so that they can adapt the tool to their use cases. So I don't know about you, you guys, but... Our organisations are all a little bit different and we all have different needs. And I think that modularity is a really, really important thing. There is no such thing as one tool that solves all problems. I've been around enough carpenters with hammers and you know, IT people with great solution that's going to fix everything. So we wanted to get a little bit away from that and introduce a bit of flexible pragmatism that meets our culture and heritage needs. Um, and also, just like the installer thing I mentioned, this is still in our backlog. But I just wanted to let you know that this is so high on our radar. So the third opportunity, um, we dove really, really deep on this. And this was led by my colleague Dan, by the designer at Boost, a guy called Nick, and supported by our harvesting team, um, some of whom are in this room today. I won't point you out and embarrass you, Tim. It's OK. Um, so by fleshing out the Supplejack user interface with the developers, these guys created a new, uh, new workflow process, which they called pipelines. And these are essentially shareable, reusable fragments of harvesting or enrichment setups that can be stitched together to create new content pipelines. So this is the new Supplejack work workflow in a nutshell. You can see there isn't like this long string of 105 million things that have to happen one after another. There's parallelization in there. Um, it does an extraction grabs all the stuff, 
and then it can run the transforms and the loading all in parallel. So it removes that bottleneck. So this is the fundamental thing that will allow us to do a crap ton more scale with harvesting and let us start tackling the big data problems for harvests. Um, and there's a handsome slide that, one of the uh, that Nick, the designer from Boost, whipped up with us. This is what a record level page looks like. So if you think about one, you know, like the equivalent of a paper's past article, for example, and it's grabbed that, the metadata sort of in the uh, left-hand side panel is the original stuff. The part on the right is what the transformed part of that data looks like. And it does those in real time so that you've got a bit of visibility into it. But what if you zoom back one layer? So this is like a, a set of weekly extractions. This looks like this. And also, I just want to acknowledge that I'm putting this on screen mainly because this is green and colourful, and I'm bombing you with a bunch of black and white slides. So bask in the green because it'll be gone soon. So stepping a bit further out, this is what the pipelines look like. Um, this is a, an example called FigShare where you've got some components which are potentially shared across other pipelines and they're all just pulled together to create this new unique pipeline that serves the needs of this harvest. And lastly, these are the schedule of all the pipeline jobs. Stitched together, ready to go, when they run, who run them, when they stopped, when they worked, when they failed, etc. So that's that. Now, you might be looking at this and say, who is this handsome bastard and why was he playing for the Junior All Blacks and the Otago Highlanders and what's he doing in this slide? This is Sean Romans. Um, he's one of the scrum masters at Boost. Now, I did quite a bit of work with Sean and we would be in the habit of catching up, having some cordial, you know, touching base, seeing how things are going, talking rugby, other things like that. Sean's a lovely guy. Um, we had a catch up. And one of those days we started talking about Supplejack. And I made the observation that the Boost developers had an inside out understanding of this software. And that the software was open source. And you know, Sean's beady little eyes focused on this and he grabbed this idea and he's run with it. And he's the reason why my colleague Gus is here today. And Gus is gonna show you some of his work. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Kia ora, ko Gus, Gustavo, toku inoa, no Brazil aho. Uh, so going back to the AI thread, so working closely with Emerson and the team on the Supplejack journey, we found this opportunity to explore some of the AI capabilities and try to put that into Supplejack and see how that looks like. Because we know that AI needs a lot of data to train models and some really good data. And one thing that Supplejack does really well is to aggregate data together and normalize it. So we thought, cool, we could explore what role Supplejack could play on this landscape. So before starting getting into the AI field, I'm just gonna say I'm not an AI expert. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties around AI and what AI holds for us, but I think what drives this uncertainty is the, there's a lot of unknown. I don't know much about it, and I feel like the best way to learn about something is just to try. Um, so we believe that by developing an understanding of how Supplejack could help AI to succeed, we could have a, more, a better understanding of how AI works and how that could uh, impact our future. So I'm going to touch a little bit about the experiment. Uh, so before we start the experiment, we had to decide what to focus on, because if you just say, like, I'm going to use AI to solve a problem, it's quite vague, and AI is quite a, a wide subject. So on this context of Supplejack, uh, we had this question around which areas do you think our Supplejack users will most benefit from, from AI? So we did a bit of a research, and we found one thing in common around all those Supplejack users that we have, that they have a huge amount of data, and sometimes when you have a huge amount of data, it can be really hard to search what you, you're looking for. And the Supplejack comes out of the box with this traditional uh, search engine that requires a lot of design, a lot of devs to create filters and search bars and make the experience quite nice for the users. But it heavily relies on keywords matching and whatever you're typing on the query has to somehow match with the data to get relevant results. And we think that maybe AI could help users to make connections with the data in different ways so they can explore the data in, without having to keep thinking, what should I put in the search results to 
to match the, the content that I have on my database. We, one thing we want to focus as well on this experiment is we want to try to integrate AI with Supplejack, but at the same time, we don't want to compromise data governance and sovereignty. We, we think that would be really valuable to understand if we could use AI tools and address some of the questions that we have around data sovereignty. Um, so be able to control the data and be able to know how that data is being used by the models in the system. So again, we went out again, did a bit more of a research, and on the internet did lots of stuff, and we found one thing in particular mm -hmm. around AI, which is called retrieval augmented generation method. And the thing that stood out for me about this is that it promises that you can leverage existing AI system, the ability to understand languages, but scope that system to just work with your data. So you can basically make sure that the data that you have is the source of truth, and you can hopefully control more the outcome of this, this method. So by the first look of it, it looks pretty interesting. So we, I have a little, a little bit of a diagram just to explain how it works. So on the left side, you have your disparate data, and then you need to transform <coughs> your data into a numerical representation that encapsulates its contextual meaning, and then store that into a vector database. And that's where things get a bit more interesting, because once that data is on a vector database, you can start asking questions about your data, and you can get some relevant results out of it. And the other thing that stood out for me on this diagram is the ability to retain everything inside that dotted lines just to yourself. So you can have your data, your transformation, and your vector knowledge all in the same place. You can control all of that, which was really interesting. So after finding this method, um, we kind of had to decide, well, where the supplejack sits into this? Um, so on this new diagram, I've, we've put supplejack where we think it will sit. So supplejack will be the piece that connects all your data and make the transformation into this vector database. So it will be the manager that manages what goes into your knowledge base. And you can easily add and remove things and have a real control of what um, the knowledge base that the AI will be um, using. So after thinking about a method and how Supplejack will fit into it, we thought the idea was looking promising. So Dan, Emerson, and I sat together one day, and we decided, well, what if we just try this with papers past data? Um, there's only 40 billion words there, so it'll be pretty easy. <laughs> so it will be quite challenging. And the other thing about papers past data is that the data in papers past are primarily derived from text extracted from OCR technology, which is amazing. It can like read text from multiple places in multiple formats, but sometimes it can give you some pretty fun results like this. So that's, <laughs> that's a screenshot of a newspaper, and then this is an attempt for this OCR to extract the text. Um, so pretty rough, but one of the things we thought was like, oh, maybe AI will be able to extract some meaningful things out of this and allow users to still find this. So that was the, the challenge. So we set up a little demo uh, using just a section of the, a little section of the paper's past data, um, the Oxford Observer newspaper. And yeah, so it's a, sort of like a, interface where you can just ask a question and see, you can get to some relevant results and some little summary of what that data is. And I just want to note that this is just a proof of concept really out of the box, so sometimes the answers get a little bit wired. Um, but yeah, we, just, we didn't spend much time fine-tuning the system, so we just want to try to see how that, that works. So I'm going to jump on the other screen here. So that's the little demo. So it's around the Oxford Observer knowledge base. So it has all the Oxford Observer, Observer newspaper. And the first example I'm going to show you is just a query that goes back to that screenshot I have about that news. And if you ask it to do news items from Brazil, there's a Brazil mention on that thing. Um, and that's how it works. So it lists a whole bunch of sources that is relevant to that question or that query, and then give you a little summary of all the things that is found. 
Um, and one interesting thing is it was able to find the little article that has some pretty um, gibberish text, which is great. Uh, but you could say, oh, this was easy because there's the word Brazil written somewhere there. But the other interesting thing is the other thing that it found, like this first um, item here, on the details about the news, nothing mentioned Brazil. It just mentioned Rio de Janeiro, Espírito Santo, and Bahia, which are provinces and states from Brazil. But the AI was able to make that connection and bring the data back. So that's just a, a different way that users can approach the data to experiment and, and find new things. Um, the other example that I would like to show you guys is something that Emerson found really interesting, which is the ability of the, this model to summarize and do a bit of a research on the data that you have. So I'm just struggling to switch screens. Um, so if you, so Charles Gordon was a cricket player that plays for Ville Hill team in Canterbury. And if you ask to summarize his career and give, give some highlights, um, it's pretty interesting how it, it's, it's able to get all the relevant sources and also give it a little summary of all the games and what this, this player was good and what the highlights he had. So yeah, so we believe like this will be a really potential good tool for people to explore the data in different ways alongside the traditional search where they can still like filter things by by depth and all that stuff, but this is just a different angle we can take to the data to try to find interesting new things. Do you have anything you want to? Uh, so I don't have anything at this point. Um, can you go for us? Yeah, I that's all the, the examples that I had. Um, I guess <laughs> we have one other you guys example that really resonated <laughs> for me, like as a person who is an amateur interested in New Zealand's culinary history. And it was something like, we were trying to find a query like this, you know, summarize something which represents the AI doing a bunch of work for a researcher to find some information. And I said something to Gus like, oh, find me some recipes for chicken, uh, recipes involving chicken, and he did a search. And one of the top three or four was um, a recipe for chicken tacos that appeared in the Oxford Observer sometime in the 1880s. And I'm interested in stuff like that. You know, from a culinary history perspective, because I've seen other weird things like that, and I thought, holy shit, that really connects some weird dots. That's a neat little discovery. Um, but Gus is being all shy and not demoing that for you. <laughs> oh, I can do that. He made some pages to the back end, that, and the taco result didn't show up. So. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make the cut anymore from that taco, so it wasn't cool. That's right. Sorry, chicken. I and I know you said that you're not an AI expert. So not even close. <laughs> But um, I'm fascinated around something like this being able to make critical decisions underneath the, the, the fetch and retrieve. Say, for instance, if you were to ask it, um, you know, like a cricket out there, yeah. fetch or retrieve a, for instance, a decolonized history of cricket. Is that something that could actually be put into? Those lovely boxes that you put in, like I, I'm, I'm so not digital man. I'm like Netflix is as tough as I get. But is that what you could end up programming into something like this if it was to be put out in the wild? Yeah, I think uh, I again I'm not an expert, but I believe there's a lot of variables you can tune to be able to craft the answer the way we want, and given control of the knowledge database that this AI have. We can ha we have more power to change the output that it's it's given, um, but all the answers that you have from here it's heavily rely on the data that you have in a knowledge database. So if your data is a colonized data, they will have reflection how this has been uh, retrieved. The understanding of what colonization is and decolonization, post colonization, that would have to come from a knowledge source that sits within this, and I can guarantee you there's bugger all relevant in our space from the Oxford Observer in the 1890s about decolonization or decolonization. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were, we're full of colonization, though. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to bring some like text knowledge into this LLM, into that you know dotted line box space that Gus showed on the early slide, then it might be able to articulate 
and use that concept with relevance to the other dimensions of our teach. Yeah. So it's about bringing the data in that might represent that type of profile. Yeah, that raises the point I, I was interested in was in, was getting back to content and partners and consent and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Can you tell us how the whole content avoids becoming a kind of a cosy echo chamber? And I'm thinking of, there are hundreds of websites out there of disinformation, the Hobson's Choice or people protest, you know, deep web sort of stuff. Is the Digital New Zealand National Library harvesting encompassing all this sort of stuff? Or is it only encompassing stuff which, oh yes, they're happy for it to be harvested? In other words, is there an echo chamber of fact built into it? There isn't. I mean, this is only based on data that is through consensual harvest processes. Mm. Yeah, for example, at well, this part of content and other part of content. Yeah, so but this is just how you does it avoid becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, there's issues like hallucination. AI do have that, and you respond to that by having, by bringing in the right expertise into that space. And in Gus's case, each one of these little vectors that we've been talking about is comprised of 1,500 dimensions. Mm. So there's some expertise you have to bring to bear into this space to know how those dimensions are reflected in the results you get. So there's. It come, the onus comes down to your practice and the expertise you bring to the problem space. There isn't necessarily an easy answer for it. Um, the short answer is you want to make sure there are several people involved and you want to look at the data you get out of it and make sure that it matches your expectations. Mm -hmm. So that would be the kind of ground truthing process that you use to validate that. I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, sort, of, sort of. It's just in the very first place, the stuff's got to be there to harvest. That's right. And if you avoid right. certain tactics, because they're, yeah, they're not nice. Yeah. Then um, the dotted box is. that Gus showed on his earlier graph, mm. that is the sum total of all of the information going into this. It's not pulling in context from the web from any other source for this whatsoever, mm. which I, I think is the part that makes this approach quite special. Mm. It means you're not putting this data within the domain of an LLM like OpenAI or any other third-party AI service who might be factoring in all these other external dimensions puts you in control of what an AI is doing with your data. Mm. And I think that's pretty powerful. Not that right, but if anyone wants to carry on the conversation, there's, there isn't a session in this room next, but there are sessions next door and when we end this room, if anyone wants to go on. Thank you.